let's talk about risk factors. The vast majority of melanomas are associated with sun exposure. So as I said, if you spend your whole life in Reykjavik, Iceland, and don't travel, and don't go to uh, Mallorca and Spain and sit out in the sun and get a horrendous sunburn two weeks a year, you're probably going to be at low risk for melanoma. Uh, even if you're pale, have freckles, blue eyes, blonde hair. Uh, whereas if you are a pale complexioned, heavily freckled individual with red hair and who always burns and never tans and doesn't know to stay the heck out of the sun, you're going to be at risk if you're living in Phoenix, as we discussed. If you're living in Queensland, Townsville, Australia, boy, you're at huge risk. Uh, that's Townsville, by the way, is a city in Queensland uh, that's probably the largest populated settlement uh, that's that close to the equator, um, where there are considerable numbers of people at risk who are pale complexion people. Most other parts of the equator around the world don't have as many uh, at risk, uh, lightly pigmented individuals. So that's why Queensland has a pretty high rate of melanoma. Uh, the total population of Australia, obviously, is only about a tenth out of the U.S., so in terms of total numbers, still the U.S. has more, but per capita, uh, Australia has a very high uh, rate of melanoma, reflecting the risk factor of sun exposure, pale complexion, nevi, hair color, eye color. Now, there are also a significant number of melanoma families, or so-called atypical nevus families, and they tend to have a genetic change in a, a gene called P16. And the patients who are in the familial atypical mole families, many of them will have a history of melanoma before the age of 40. Um, many members of the family will have had melanoma. Um, and they almost always are people with a very pale complexion. And even though they may not have a large number of freckles, they will always have a large number of so-called atypical moles. And again, the more you're in the business, the more you tend to pick these people out walking on the street. It's uh, difficult to go to the beach, which I don't do very much anyway, as you can imagine. But when I lived in Southern California, if I go to the beach, it would be very awkward. You would see someone at a distance who obviously had a lot of atypical moles and you would wonder, boy, are they aware that they're at risk? Or, or gee, are they in an atypical mole family? So those are the major risk factors and those are the things uh, uh, we have to be aware of. Uh, genetically, the interestingly, in metastatic melanoma, we're very conscious of the genetic changes. Strangely enough, it turns out that many of those genetic changes go way back early in the process. And even when you have a, a so-called uh, atypical nevus, you can detect the same genetic changes that you see in a metastatic advanced melanoma, yet that genetic change doesn't have any operational significance. Um, it's other genetic changes that have to develop to make the original genetic change be important. Uh, the other importance of genetic changes is more in advanced melanoma when they could present something that's a quote target unquote. So we call them targetable mutations. And that's why uh, the genetics can be important. You know, I think we already talked about those who are at greatest risk for melanoma. Uh, as I said, our clientele in a melanoma clinic tends significantly to be um, pale complexioned individuals of Northwestern European extraction who have red and blonde hair or um, a lot of freckles, blue and green eyes, so that they tend to be uh, the population at greatest risk. In fact, when I was at the USC in Los Angeles, the epidemiologist did a study of uh, uh, um, sun exposure, type of sun exposure, duration, and the risk of melanoma. They didn't want to do it in the general population. They wanted to get an at-risk population. So you know what they did? They uh, spoke to the Department of Motor Vehicles in California, and they obtained a mailing list, which people had given permission for. 
of all people with green and blue eyes in Los Angeles. Because in California, you have to list your eye color on your driver's license. So that's how they got the at-risk population to send questionnaires to. Anybody who had green and blue eyes and you lived in Los Angeles and had a driver's license, that's, that's a lot of people. But still, it's selected for the people at highest risk. 